like to say a very warm welcome to this uh, GFSI panel session. It's about public, private data sharing in terms of, of uh, trying to prevent some serious issues that can happen across our, our food supply systems. And um, I think for, for many years, what, what I have done is uh, I've investigated serious issues about, about food safety, about food fraud, because that's, that's kind of my job. My name is Chris Elliott. I'm professor of food safety at Queen's University, Belfast. And I guess for <clears throat> five years plus, really thought about <clears throat> this whole idea about collecting data, analyzing data, and then producing really uh, Im important outcomes from, from, from that system. What one of the initiatives that I uh, instigated back in 2014, six years ago, was after the horsemeat scandal in, in Europe. <clears throat> and uh, one, one of the recommendations that I made to, to the UK government was that <clears throat> there has to be much, much better ways of sharing sensitive information. And the outputs and the outworkings of that was the formation of what we call FIN. And FIN is the Food Industry Intelligence Network. There only is one FIN in the world, in the UK. And it comprises nearly 50 businesses with a turnover, I think something like 150 billion per year is <clears throat> really uh, very large national, multinational companies. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about Finn over the next uh, one, one and a half hours. And also we, we have been thinking about <clears throat> the, the collection, the interpretation of data, not to look at issues that, that are present now, but may arise in the future. <clears throat> and this is the whole idea about predictive analytics, predicting issues and then dealing with them. So going from being reactive to being proactive. But what we've done is we've put a really nice panel of people together. And Francesca, if you could move our slides forwards. And what we're going to do is, there's going to be two rounds of questions and and you know, normally in a, in a boxing match in, in, in the Olympics, there's three rounds. So I, I'm only gonna I'm only gonna spar with the, the, the panel for, for two rounds because I'm I'm such a, a nice guy. But it's gonna be, you know, a bit of a question and answer session, a bit of a conversation, maybe maybe provoke a little bit of, of, of controversy. Of course, that's what I, I really like to do. And what I want you to do, invite you as the audience, you know, in in, in the QA chat box. Let, let's get some, you know, difficult questions. Certainly not for me, but yes, absolutely for, for the panel. So maybe if you just move on to our next slide. <clears throat> what, what I'll now do is introduce our panel. And, and I, I just think it, it is a, a phenomenal blend of people from the food industry, from a regulatory environment, but also from the world of, of data. <laughs> So first of all, we have with us is Sarah Mortimer, who is Vice President of Global Food Safety at Walmart. Walmart, the world's largest uh, food retailer. We have Peter Whelan, who, who is a, a good friend of mine. And, and Peter is Director of Audit and Investigations at the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. Peter and I have investigated a few things together over the years. Third panel member is Helen Sisson also a good friend of mine, and one of the co-founders of FIN. And uh, I would say Helen's day job is technical director of the Two Sisters Food Group, and one of the largest uh, food manufacturing companies in the UK. And, and fourth and, and, and last, but by no means last, is Janice Stortis, who is founder and CTO, CTO of Agrino. And Agrino is a data analytics company. And we've been doing a lot together over the past 12 months, looking at data collection, uh, predictive analytics, and looking for these safe spaces where you where information can be analyzed and exchanged. So if we just move on to our next slide. 
So round one of the boxing match, as I call it, <laughs> this is about opportunities and opportunities in terms of unlocking the massive amount of data sets that are out there. You know, the world is full of data. There, there is absolutely no doubt about that. Individual companies have data. You can get open source, you can get closed source data. <clears throat> but one of the big issues is about trust. Who do you trust with your information? Who do you trust with your data? <clears throat> this can be highly confidential information. It, it can be sensitive to your business. It can create problems if it gets into the wrong hands. So round one is really about this whole question about opportunities of, of data trust. So what I'm gonna do is I'm, go, I'm going to uh, ask Helen. Helen, the first question to you. Now, I've already said, Helen, you're, you're one of the co-founders, the co-creators of Finn. So in, in terms of your own experience about setting up a data sharing platform, and it could be Finn or it could be other things, what do you think the, the critical points were in terms of actually getting Finn to operate and to get that trusted space? And then we'll talk a little bit about not only sharing information between companies, but companies and regulators as well. So over to you, Helen, what, what's your first initial thoughts? Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, um, as Chris has said, you know, the, the concept of um, in, an intelligence sharing network came out of um, Chris's report after the Horsegate scandal. And a, a group of technical leaders from across the industry in the UK sat in a room and said, what are we going to do about this? Um, but we all agreed that what we wanted to do, we wanted to be meaningful. We didn't want to tick a box. We actually wanted to create something that would add value um, to all our organisations. And, you know, we had to sort of think about how we would do this. How were we going to set it up? And I'll be honest, the initial meetings in the room with people from different companies was a little bit of, I'm not sharing mine with you. And, <laughs> you know, and a, a little bit of, Ooh, how are we going to do this? I, I think... A eureka moment in, in the early days of setting up Finn was establishing how we were going to make this data safe. A, a lot of it of what people worried about, well, what happens if it gets out? Um, you know, and, and even in the early days, there was a bit of nervousness about what you do with the regulator. What about the media? How are we going to create this safe haven, which I think Chris called it in his report? Um, and what we did, we established a relationship with a, a legal firm, and. We identified a way of getting the information to flow through what we called our legal host through the legal firm. Um, and that data, when it came out the other end, was going to be anonymized. So that gave companies the confidence to submit their data into this safe space. Uh, that data couldn't be linked to any company other than the le legal host who, who knew who was submitting what only in the event of any questions or points of clarity that would come out later on. And ultimately, all that information would get consolidated um, to come back out in what we call our thin quarterly report. And, you know, that, that really was a moment in time where people went, oh, I can see how this can work. I can see how my data can be safe. Um, I can see how, also I can see what I can get out of it. Because I think that was the other thing when we set up thin is, you know, we're asking people to, to trust each other in the first place actually we're asking one food business to trust the other food business um we also had a little bit of understanding that if we find any you know deviations in the data or any test results that look a bit odd that we're all not going to go rushing off delisting suppliers or doing something silly that we'll follow the investigations we'll, we'll do the traceability and actually you know use that information to inform our own insights to inform our own testing programs and that in its own right had a positive effect. You know, we could see examples where in the early days, everybody was testing meat because of the, the scandal that had happened. But actually when one company might have found a, an erroneous result on one particular other supply chain, the following quarter, we'd find that other companies had gone and had a look at that supply chain. So from the early days of getting that trust and getting people to share the information, people could start to see how they could use that information to the benefit of their own businesses. So I think it really was about creating that safety, that place of safety, that data was there and creating, you know, there was a bit of a leap of faith in the early days amongst companies to create that trust amongst themselves. Um, and, and we also had this always this bit of a motto is we, we're going to walk before we can run. 
you know, and I guess as we develop these questions, we can talk about how Finns evolved since then. But um, it was that creation of the safe space that was the breakthrough. Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. The thing about who will see your data can be tracked back to you and it can cause issues with, with your business. And you know, that leap of faith that you talked about, Helen, I think was absolutely magnificent. And there was a, a small group of what I call really, you know, absolute leaders, technical leaders of, of the UK food industry led that. You also said, you know, it has evolved. It's evolved over five years since its creation. And, you know, the next leap of faith was also then sharing the data with regulatory authorities. And mm -hmm. I just to talk through, you know, how you managed to deal with that yep. and all of the additional layers of complexity. Yeah, so, so, you know, I think it's fair to say in the early days of FIN, all the regulators were very interested in what we were doing, but we felt that we needed to get trust amongst the members first. And once we got that trust, and as I say, the value was starting to be created for the members of the network, we started to have dialogue with the regulators and, and because of the UK system that meant having dialogue with all the devolved authorities so we were in separate dialogue with particularly um, Scotland, Ireland and England um, and we had to, I think there was a point of principle, whatever we did with data sharing between Finn and the regulator needed to be two way, we, we were very clear for the network that that was really important that if Finn was going to share its data in, in an anonymized way with the regulator, what would Finn get back in return? Uh, what would the members get back in return? And that was a really important principle. And we needed also to keep that theme of protecting the data. Um, you know, we, we knew and we'd established how we were doing that for the members um, amongst themselves, but we needed to flow that theme through to how we worked with the regulator. And what we did with each, each of the regulators and each of the devolved authorities was create an intelligence sharing agreement. So, you know, it sounds a bit formal and maybe a bit was, but it was important for the members to buy into that and have the confidence again to, you know, to move Finn on as a network. And, and that first agreement was signed roughly a year after the Finn got up and running. Um, oh. Finn was formed in the middle of 2015 and, and got formally set up as a company, if you like, um, in, in the October and it was the following September that we find, signed our first agreement. So it was a year of getting the network up and running, honing the data sharing. Um, but as I say, it was about, you know, having a formal agreement, each party knowing, knowing what we were doing with the other party, protecting the information again, and, and creating a two-way process. Uh, and that's moved on even further. You know, it's gone from just sharing the data to now every quarter, after the FIN report is published, we sit down, in fact, Peter and I are in a meeting tomorrow, um, we sit down with, with all the regulators and have a multi-agency um, intelligence sharing meeting um, where we share the FIN data, they share what, what's going on at, in their world. And that you know, may result in and has resulted in the past in you know, particular investigations or actions being taken as a result of that forum. And what we do, the, the key actions and insights from that meeting get put, put on the FIN website, which was another development, um, so that members also get, get some form of output from that um, forum, which takes place with a couple of the board members with the regulators. So, so very much, um, you know, an involving information sharing from initially food industry and through to all the regulators as well. And that's absolutely super, Helen. Thank you. And, you know, just for, for the audience, I do believe, and uh, I stand to be corrected, but I think the data that sits in FIN is the world's largest repository of food authenticity testing. That That's the scale that, that FIN has reached now. I think this is a good time maybe to go on to Janice now, because Janice, you, you're, you're a guy who really likes to, to, to manipulate and, and look at data. So, in terms of, of the, the massive data sets that are being collected, how do you think we can go from being that reactive that I talked about to the proactivity about preventing uh, you know, big food safety uh, issues, scandals that, that, that might happen in the future? Thank you very much, Chris. First of all, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, in the same panel with Sarah, Helen, Peter, and you, of course, Chris. Uh, so I will start with the second part of the question, which is uh, uh, 
link to the which are the best data sources that can give us better predictions. So the value of the of a data source uh, in terms of uh, predictions depends very much on the parameters that we need to include in our prediction models. So the best data sources are the ones that will provide information and data for a parameter that is very important for the prediction of the risks that we want to make. Uh, I will give an example for, from the fraud uh, side, from the fraud perspective. If, for instance, the fraud risk depends very much on production and trade information, then having data sources for these parameters is very important in contrast to having data for parameters that is not important for predicting the fraud risk for a specific uh, ingredient or commodity. So such data sources that provide information for very critical factors for the uh, risk predictions are the ones that are the, are the best ones and the ones that can provide value. And of course, there we need to be very careful because this data should be accurate, uh, should be trusted data, uh, and should be combined and interconnected so we can apply the algorithms in clean and accurate data. Regarding the scenarios that we can have from such a uh, critical, from such a massive data and some big data that we have in the supply chain. So I will mention three, but of course, this is not the, uh, these are not the only ones. There are many more that we can uh, still be discussing in this panel. So I will start from the scenario uh, that is very close to uh, what Helen described uh, for the case of Finn. Uh, so it is very important to have data sharing uh, in order to align all the lab tests, the lab data tests, other, either this is for authenticity purposes or for safety purposes, and which are generated by the private, but also by the public labs. Having an aggregated view of all the lab tests and knowing the protocols that were used for the test, because then we, we may be sure, we can be sure that we can use this data in a safe way because they are trusted, then this uh, will establish a scenario that can strengthen the predictive capabilities because we'll create the critical mass of uh, analytical results of lab tests uh, that could be used to identify emerging risks in the supply chain. And uh, what Helen already described is very much to that uh, scenario, to that direction. The second scenario is uh, from the certification uh, sector. So, for instance, if we focus only on one part of the certification section, uh, sector, like uh, the inspection results performed by uh, governments, by, uh, by, but also by certification bodies and by third party, third party uh, auditors, uh, these are very important, very critical information that right now is trapped, is closed in local databases, in documents, in PDF files, and uh, this does not allow to have all the required information that could be used uh, based on these results, based on these outcomes of the inspections, to be able to predict very important events that may happen in the uh, food supply chain. Another very interesting scenario that uh, we, uh, we heard also during the last three days in the uh, GFSI is how to share and combine, combine data that come from consumers. Uh, we call this uh, in our team, the consumer's voice. So it may include, this data may include reviews, complaints, comments about uh, the taste, or even the report of foodborne illness. illness. The e-commerce in the food sector will play a very important role in the next year. So being able to share such data uh, between the e-commerce platforms and the, the manufacturers and the retailers can provide a critical mass of data 
that will help the development of uh, risk, risk prediction models. So this is also a very interesting uh, scenario. And of course, for all these scenarios, it's very important to the, this data to be delivered in a way, in a easy unified way, so they can be used uh, by the uh, people, by the people that are developing the prediction models. Uh, either this is inside the food company or it is in a technology company that provides services to the food company. So this is what we are trying also to do. Uh, to, uh, to aggregate this data, to collect and process this data, but the most important is to give this data in an easy and unified way, way is uh, a very important priority that uh, we are working and we should be looking when we are talking about uh, data sharing scenarios. Yeah, <clears throat> many thanks for that, Kiamas. Well, I think that takes me on really nicely to my, my question I'd like to pose to Sarah, because yeah, Walmart is a reasonably large company. <laughs> I think you collect huge amounts, vast amounts of, of, of data. And then it's in terms of, you know, can, can you think of some scenarios where the collection, the analysis of that data has really helped boost the predictive capabilities for, for your company and maybe the broader food industry? Um, a little bit, I would say. Um, we do have vast amounts of data. Um, a lot of that is internal data, I would say, that we're looking at predictive capability. So we have um, 11,000 odd stores. We have um, tons and tons of audit data, temperature monitoring data, um, sanitation data. And of course, all of that is increasingly being collated to look at pest data, all of it. Um, some of it's collected by third parties, some of it's collected by our internal associates. Um, and uh, aggregating that more and more and looking at what that tells us. So I guess we've tested our way a little bit in, in this area by, by looking at all the data we have readily available to us that isn't fraught with the legal difficulties that Helen described when Finn was first set up or uh, that because it's our data and it, it's perhaps more readily accessible. That said, some of it, of course, resides in third parties. So do, how, how much we trust the, the security of that data. But that's certainly been very helpful in terms of um, predicting likelihood of failure at the store level. Um, I'm really interested in Finn because I can certainly see a scenario of how data sharing could boost preventive capabilities in the future. And I'm, I'm as Helen was talking, and as you were talking, Janice, um, I was thinking about, and I've been thinking a lot about leafy greens in the United States. It's a huge challenge to many of us and thinking about the learnings of Finn and whether um, that could be leveraged in some way as, a, as an opportunity to more share data and information than we have in the past. Um, Walmart's probably the biggest purchaser of leafy greens in the US, possibly anywhere. Um, but as you know, uh, leafy greens have been fraught with problems over the last years with E. coli um, challenges, recalls. Most years we've had recalls and multiple ones, highly costly, highly disruptive. Um, and Walmart has pioneered, I guess, the use of blockchain as a data trust example where you know we've got immutable data going from our suppliers we've got over 90 percent of our supplier data now from leafy greens going onto the blockchain so we can very rapidly tra trace to the field yeah. where our leafy greens have come from but that's immutable data it, it relies on it being correct when it goes in what i'm thinking about in listening to helen is test data and how could we aggregate test data for the for the common good, for the good of the industry, where we've got multiple companies doing testing, multiple suppliers, as well as customers testing. And I know there are some projects um, being discussed to, to look at whether that could happen pre-harvest testing, test and hold data, a lot of test data that I think would be available that would really, really help us in predicting prevalence, really. And, and therefore root cause analysis uh, for the future uh, as to 
how and where and why some of these issues happen. We know the root cause exactly and that it's cattle mostly or animals, uh, proximity to, to leafy greens, produce, agriculture, but the, um, the patterns and the reasoning isn't always clear as yet, but a lot of, a lot of companies getting together on that. Interestingly, Helen, talking just as you were describing, there's a lot of retailers get together, a lot of producers get together. We've got multiple coalitions underway. We haven't yet taken that next step in terms of how can we get further along in terms of preventive capability that will give us better predictions. So really exciting conversation, I think, and I'm really glad to have joined and joined the discussion. Yeah, thanks for that, Sarah. And, you know, I think the, the uh, implementation of blockchain, as you talked about, fantastic. And I mean, I'm involved in a multitude of blockchain projects, but it is, you know, the, the value of blockchain is, is the value of the quality and the accuracy of the data that goes into it. You know, it's easy to put bad information into a blockchain as it is into a, a you know, a, a, a ledger. And I think often we talk about the, the verification of blockchain is through the the analysis, the testing that goes on. So I think there's there's phenomenal opportunities there. And you know, I think the the example that you gave is a really good one because I think very very good hard data analytics added to all of the testing that goes on will give you much much more information about what is 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 coming down the road. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Going to maybe switch a little bit now to Peter. So, Peter, you know, you you are the cuckoo in the nest, okay? Because you are the one that everybody dreads. You're the regulator, okay? And sharing information with regulators and, and you know, joking apart is really can be extremely difficult for for a number of different reasons. And we know that a lot of regulatory authorities, you know, don't have access to that much data, you know, food safety data, certainly food authenticity data. So I know you're, you're very much uh, welcome the, the, the opportunity of joining Finn. And I just wonder what has that brought to you as a regulator and how do you think that what has happened there could be expanded to other areas that, that, that public private partnerships can work to in terms of this whole uh, um, area of, of data sharing? Yeah, well, I think Chris just taking up that last point. We're, I mean, the concept of generating and storing and holding data is a very old one. We've all filled up database after database after database, and everybody wanted more and more and more. And it was all in silos. So I think what the real move here is that's novel and is innovative is we're getting rid of this silo idea. And the Food Standards Agency in the UK brought out a document called Regulating Our Future. And they suggested that there would be big sharing of data with industry and that that would generate all types of benefits. And the FDA have now said with data trusts, they think there should be all of this sharing of data. And they're even looking at sharing it amongst themselves because they've difficulties between each of their states and how they share data. We've been talking to EFSA as well, the European Food Safety Authority, and they're talking about the concept of data lakes um, where data is stored in a well-tagged way um, that respects confidentiality, um, but it, all of the data is connected. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in one location, but it's all connected and it's interoperable and it's usable by anyone who has whatever model they like pointed to that data. So it doesn't even have to be a common language. So that's a great move forward. The EU recognises this because in the EU Food Fraud Network, we're now amalgamating into IMSOC, the um, information management system for official controls, the IRAS of data, the administrative assistance data, administrative assistance food fraud, traces, Eurofight. So there's a whole lot of databases being merged together there. Um, now, merging data is one thing. It's, it's, as you say, it's what we do with it. But for me, Finn has been the greatest example of how you bring data and share data for us. When we get data, as you said, Chris, mo most of the time we get vast amounts of data is when we take it. When we have an investigation and uh, an industry sector has hidden information or, or a particular firm has hidden information and we go with warrants and we go with legal provisions and we, we take all the data we can get and 
we analyze it and we look for wrongdoing, but that's not the place we want to be in because that's a, that's the, that's a last resort. With Finn, that's not the case. With Finn, we make great use of the data that we have there. We use it to inform our official controls. We use it to inform our investigations. We use it in our chemical sampling program which we develop every year. We use it to give our labs focus. We use it in the coordinated control program in the EU. We've actually had food selected on the basis of Finn data. We use it in OPSIN and we have informed OPSIN investigations and targeted actions on, on the basis of Finn data. So tremendous use of data there. So there's a big move away from traditional inspection. So traditional inspection of an inspector turns up and wants to inspect the premises and do an audit. Um, that doesn't cut it anymore. And certainly in terms of investigation of food fraud, it has to be intelligence led and it has to be forensic. Um, but to move away from traditional inspection, um, we do need to move to a situation where we can leverage each other's data or leverage each other's data analytics or share third party audits. So that the outputs from one organization can become the inputs for another. So we're not seeing repeated um, generation of data that doesn't need to happen. So if it's done once, it should be available and then it's the input for the next person who wants to use it. I suppose to, um, for this to work really, we have to embrace ways of processing and analyzing data, big data particularly. And we need to be focused in how we generate, I suppose, targeted requests for specific purposes. So you don't want the regular regulator coming in saying, I want to see everything and I want it all available to me. Uh, that does no good for the regulator and it does no good for the industry or the industry sector. So we need to be careful about how we target and have specific purposes for what we do. We also need to be very careful about how we balance confidentiality and transparency and accountability. So really important. So if a regulator gets access to a lot of data and confidentiality is broken or proprietary interest, well then people won't feel comfortable in sharing that data anymore, nor should they, and, and properly so. But what we can bring is, we have an enormous amount of data. We have a microbiological sampling program, we have a chemical sampling program, we have a residue sampling program, we have a pesticide sampling program, we have authenticity sampling, we do sampling uh, attached to outbreaks, we do a coordinated patrol program, we have the OPSIN results, uh, we're on the EFSA horizon scanning. So we have a huge amount of data. And we need to find ways that we can move that data into the democratization of data where it can be used by everyone. It's not just my data, your data, it's our data. Um, but to make real use of this though, we have to move, as Janice was saying, we have to move to artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, so we have to get smart about how we analyze big data sets um, and what we want from them and how we're going to use them. Um, and then we have to demonstrate benefits. If we're not seeing benefits like uh, more rapid traceability, uh, finding a source of an outbreak and stopping it really quickly, uh, linking outbreaks through uh, genome sequencing has been a huge uh, advantage of, of data. Um, investigating outbreaks and coming to quick results and then learning those lessons to put in preventative measures. Um, because we all want public health to be protected, whether you're a regulator or whether you're industry or whether you're an academic, everybody wants the same results, that there's a good product on the market that's authentic, uh, it is what it says it is, and it's safe. And we're all looking towards that goal. So food authorities are not competing. So we have no competitive advantage when industry share data. And um, you might think that your competitor has and you're afraid of what they might see, but we don't have that. So we don't come to the table looking for any competitive advantage. But we do need to incentivize data sharing. We need to be part of that incentivization. So if we can say, share your data with us, we'll use it to risk profile, and then we'll use it to maybe on a risk basis, we look at the inspection frequency or the inspection type. Industry might welcome that because uh, sometimes the inspection doesn't do a whole lot for us and doesn't do anything for you. But if we have more focus because we can depend on the data sets we have, we can change that. And food safety culture, three weeks ago, the European Union brought in new legislation and they've now made it a legal requirement for industry to have food safety cultures. And they've now made a very specific legal requirement for managers and management 
to show and demonstrate legally that they've introduced this food safety culture and they have to show that they've taken all of these actions which have led to safe food. So what better way than sharing your data to show that? Um, so I'll just finish on um, digital ecosystem is the way forward. We should be part of it. We need to be part of it. And we need to come to the table with a positive view on it. Peter, many thanks. And uh, I, think, I think a lot of the, the points that you raised will, will come, come back in, in, in round two when, when I ring the bell for that. Now, we've had some questions have come in from the participants. Please feel free to ask uh, some more. What, what I will do is I'm going to use the chair's prerogative. I'm going to ask the first question. And I think what we've heard from all of the speakers is about the, the, the wealth of data that, that is out there. And I often compare it to an onion, okay? Because an onion is just layer after layer after layer. Now, how, what's the way, what are the mechanisms that you can actually take all of those layers of data and decomplicate them and turn them from data to intelligence, these sort of dashboards that we talk about. So I'd like to put that to Janice. That's your challenge is how does a company like Agri know? How does it take and aggregate all of that data, convert it to something that is really very easy to follow? Thank you. It's a great point. Thank you, Chris. So it's very important what we do in order to connect all these different layers. And I like very much uh, the idea of uh, thinking it as an onion is that uh, we have an approach that is based on two things. The first is how we can use standards in the way that data is represented uh, for uh, different properties and important fields, like for instance, products or hazards or companies, uh, how we can use the standards so we can ensure the interoperability between the data, between the different layers. So, the, for instance, the information of a company will be almost in all layers. So if the company is identified using a standard way with a global identifier, like for instance, the GLN or the one that was proposed by FDA, then it is possible to track this company throughout the different layers, throughout the different stages of the supply chain. So this is, this is very important. Following such an approach for all the different important parameters or properties or fields, name them as, uh, as you like, is very critical in order to have a combined and interconnected data set interconnected big data from all these different layers. The second thing that uh, we apply is that we are using uh, vocabularies, we are using ontologies that have the knowledge of the domain. So what does this mean with an example? Uh, if we use a very well-structured and hierarchical uh, ontology for or taxonomy or vocabulary for hazards and for fraud issues, then we can have there the knowledge of the domain. So for instance, if we have under chemical hazards, all the different types of hazards as a, a <clears throat> child uh, terms, every time that we will identify mycotoxin, we can automatically uh, and give the to machines the knowledge that the mycotoxins are part of the game. <clears throat> so in this way, we can connect the data with throughout the different layers, and we can also keep the knowledge for uh, the specific uh, data that we are collecting. We can also have the semantics for the specific data. So this enables uh, the very nice intelligence dashboard that uh, you mentioned, where you can drill down to very specific problems. You can answer very specific questions, like for instance, give me all the mycotoxins, all the aflatoxin cases that were identified 
uh, in uh, pistachio nuts from uh, uh, border rejections, in border rejections, import refusers, but also food recalls. So we can go through, the, uh, I have already described different layers of the onion, eh? the onion, the layer of the border, the layer of the uh, market, of the shelves, of the uh, retailer. So having such a knowledge between and such a standard way of identifying the properties of the data, we are able to provide answers to such uh, uh, complex questions. Uh, and this is only possible if the data are interconnected. If we have this, if we are using data standards and semantics that will have the knowledge of the domain inside the, uh, the system that we are using. Many thanks, Janice. We have quite a number of questions starting to come in now, all very data centric. I'm going to bat in the next one to Helen. And the question is, are the data collected under FIN made available anonymously? What do you actually do with the data that, that FIN collects? Yeah, so, so we, we collect the data on a quarterly basis. Um, each member, we have a, a standard template, which um, we've literally just launched a brand new database in March um, as part of the latest development of the network. So that information from that member company gets put into the law firm, for want of a better word, and, and they scramble that data um, and consolidate it all. So when that data comes out in the form of a report, it's completely anonymized. Um, so all members see that report, they see all the consolidated data, so they'll see all the tests, all, all the foods are div divided into subgroups, um, which is in line with the um, BRC global standard um, categories for food. Um, so if you want to search on meat or you want to search on olive oil or you want to search on what, whatever material, you can do that. But the data is completely anonymized. Um, there's only if there's um, only the law firm can, if there's a query thinking, oh, that doesn't look quite right, or is there an error in the submission? Only the law firm can go back to the member company and query it. The board or all the other members do not know whose data is what. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, the next question in terms of the data is about how do you assess the quality of it? You know, because lots and lots of data comes into FIN. Is, is, are there any, you know, simple analytical chemist and we have got lots of gates that you have to go through before you actually take the data and, and think it's meaningful. So how, how does FIN deal with, with quality assurance of data? Yeah. I mean, as a network, we don't specifically at this point specify certain testing or test methods, but we do collect that information. Yeah. So, so we are, you know, somewhat reliant on member companies submitting their data into the network. And, you know, we, we do sort of make some recommendations in certain areas around certain test methods for certain ingredients. Uh, you know, and we, what we have um, under the board, we have a technical steering group and where there's particular challenges in particular sectors. So one of the examples would be sort of free range eggs. We might commission a bit of a study on that, which we did in this case to say, you know, what is the best test method for that particular um, ingredient material supply chain um, and make recommendations to the members on, on what to use. But what we do do is we, we, we require, there's an element of free text that goes into it as well. So if there's a, um, a result that doesn't look quite right, um, then we, we're asking members to provide as much information as possible on that investigation. So you might, for example, get a speciation issue where you've, you know, you're you picking up one species that shouldn't be there, but do, do we think that could genuine, genuinely be fraudulent activity or actually could it be poor GMP practice in the factory because you are not cleaned down between one line and the other? So we use the members data but we also use their investigations and traceabilities to back up what the results might be saying um so um I, I guess that's probably one of the main ways we do that um as opposed to can we sift every result no we can't because the data does need to remain anonymous <laughs> and in order to do oh, that right. you've got you've got you've got to to a degree trust what's coming in um, the one thing I perhaps didn't mention is it's not just test data we also use in the network. We also some um, members traceability information as well. 
So we recognize that a lot of people, there's a lot of testing and that does form the majority of the data. Um, but we also, where people are using traceabilities to challenge supply chains, we collect those as well. And that information also goes into the network and gets consolidated and um, you know, sent back out to members in the final report, which again, can back up what some of the test results might be saying. Super, Helen, many thanks. To, to you, Peter, now, there, there's a number of questions have come in in terms of, of re regulatory um, um, issues. And one that I think is very pertinent is about public authorities willing to share food safety data with the community. And, and you know, is that something that you do at the moment or you think would be could be done? And again, how would you manage such a complex process? Yeah, um, the Food Safety Authority of Ireland is, believes in transparency and is very transparent. So on our website, there's a huge volume of data available. Um, I, I see a note about recall. All of our recalls and all of our alerts are put up on our website so that everybody can see them and see the reasons for them. Um, we also share our pesticide data, our veterinary medicines data, our zoonosis data and our contaminants data with, the, with EFSA and EFSA make them all publicly available. So all of that data, now not many people know this, but all of that data is out there and is publicly available. So there is already a lot of sharing of data. We are restricted in some ways, um, whereas we can publish our own uh, enforcement actions and we also publish the report that goes with that enforcement action. We are restricted by European legislation in that we can't reveal what we found on official controls. So we can't actually say we found the following on an inspection and put it up on the website. Um, but you know, we do respond quite openly to FOIs, Freedom of Information Requests, and we give out as much data as we're legally permitted to. Um, we also have to respect GDPR and data protection. So um, we do that, but, but we're inclined to give as much as we can we find excuses to give data rather than to hold it back. Thanks, Peter. Sarah, the last question from, from, from audience that's coming, I'd like to put to you because I think as a company, you probably get lots and lots of information about food safety risks. And a lot of that will be through, uh, we talked about social media trolling and so forth. But what you won't get there is any information, clues, or evidence about authenticity. So how does your company collect information about authenticity? What, what might be the sources? And do you think that might be a weakness in, in your current armory? Well, we, we, like many others, I guess, subscribe to some of the services, which I suspect Finn um, is behind uh, in terms of horizon scanning kind of tools. Uh, we find those incredibly helpful um, to give us a, an idea of where to look. Many of our markets have testing programs. And they have to be based on what we feel are the, the, the likely places that we should be looking. We can't test everything uh, and so on. But um, it, I guess it's about building trust with your suppliers as well. That, but um, I really like the onion piece because it's built, it's drilling down from your, your, your immediate supplier down to their suppliers, to their suppliers, to their suppliers. Yeah. Of course, that's often when we we have issues, or, or many of my counterparts also have issues where it's those hidden ingredients that cause problems. But certainly, horizon scanning type tools are very valuable to us, and we do have test programs based on risk assessments that we conduct in a number of the markets. Are they perfect? Probably they can be improved, but we're um, and we are strengthening our programs all the time in terms of um, threat and vulnerability assessment type programs that we're looking to standardize now across our markets. We haven't had a standardized a program before. That's just coming in this year. We're implementing a more standardized approach. Um, and then we have to figure out how we can share more widely across our internal businesses too. Because as you say, Chris, we do have a lot of internal data and we have a lot of markets to share that with. But um, we, we do find some of the external tools incredibly valuable in helping us focus on where to look. You can't really look everywhere. So where do you start? Yeah, absolutely. So there's many thanks for that. I'm going to move on to the second round of questions. Thanks, thanks for all of the questions that came in from the audience. Please keep them coming in. I, uh, do, I don't want to give this panel any, any easy moments at all. So Helen, 
Now, back to you. We've talked about a lot of the opportunities. You've talked about some of the uh, unbelievable uh, benefits of having Finn. But there must have been a myriad, a myriad of technical issues that had to be dealt with. You know, I, I sit as I, I, I think I call it a, a, a critical friend on the board of Finn, and I just sat and I listened to all of these different technical problems that never entered my mind when I kind of went to industry. Go away and do this; it would be a good idea. So, you know, again, for those people who are thinking about sh setting up data sharing uh, initiatives. You know, what, what were the real things that you thought were, were, were nearly showstoppers, you know, as, as Finn was being developed? Yeah, I mean, oh gosh, that's a big question. Um, I, I think, as I've already mentioned, the, the protection piece, which was fundamental to getting us off the ground. Um, and, and once we'd got over that hurdle, it was, you know, how, how on earth are we going to collect the data and what are we going to collect? Um, and in honesty, we really did start with a spreadsheet. Um, and then we sort of thought, you know, then it's sort of, what food categories do we need to do? How do we separate them out? You know, if we do fats and oils, but then what about olive oil? What about, you know, other fats and oils? Then, then we sort of, well, oh, actually country of origin would be quite useful information to have as well. Uh, and it started to sort of to trigger a, a framework and a format around how we collected that data, the categories we collected in it and the information we wanted. So it went from, you know, starting with a few food groups, you know, meat, <laughs> dairy, to then breaking down those food groups into the various sectors um, and collecting further information. So, and as I say, that started with a simple spreadsheet and the network launched with 21 members and that was challenging enough. As the membership grew, the, the next phase was to get us a slightly more sophisticated basic database and we worked with um, another company to put that in place. And then literally only just a few weeks ago, we've, we've done, you know, quite a huge development actually in terms of a much more sophisticated data collection system, which is going to allow members to upload their information much more easily and will give members their own dashboard um, in terms of being able to manipulate that data and play with that data in a more meaningful way. So, so as I say, what to collect, how to collect and how to present it. So again, you know, um, the member benefits as well. You know, again, the, the members initially got a quarterly report um, and with some support from Chris to give a bit of an overview on that report. Um, then we set up a technical steering group and that technical steering group would review that report and based on what the results were telling us, but based on the knowledge from, you know, a group of technical experts in the room, a technical steering group report went into the quarterly report and that would make recommendations of what to look for um you know to make recommendations and where to target your testing uh, um and we we also have an annual members meeting and one of the um questions we had at the last meeting was could we have a top 10 list of ingredients to target awesome. so now that report has a top 10 list of ingredients to target and, and along the way, we've, you know, there's also a newsletter on food fraud that we have another partner helps us create that. Um, uh, we have the website where we put posts. Um, we also have the, the facility now, because that was one of the other challenges is what happens if I get a bit of intelligence, what do I do with it? And I've got that bit of intelligence outside the quarterly cycle. So do I really want to wait another three months to share that? Um, so, so we have a member alert system um, where we can say, oh, there's a bit of intelligence in this area or a member's flag day particular challenge and we can get that out to members very quickly. So, so as I say, from a technical point of view, once we got, over, you know, it's, it was getting that initial trust. It was getting the confidentiality secured. It was creating a means to collect that data on a quarterly basis. Increasingly, as the network's developed and the membership's developed, because we've more than doubled the membership now, um, how do we make that data, data collection easier and how do we get make creation of the quarterly reports easier and then how do we make it even more value to members through being able to manip manipulate that data and use it for their own use um, and you know making you know the, the, the network that members are clear on the benefits they get for the network as I've said all the added value extras you don't just get the report but you get a lot of extras being part of the network and I think that's really helped, um, you know, help us grow the network and extend our reach. 
um, and we just obviously hope to continue to grow the network and particularly target areas where we might feel we're a bit underrepresented in certain categories. But, but hopefully that gives you a reasonable overview on some of those challenges. You know, it was tremendous because I think you've just summarised about five years efforts in about three minutes. So <laughs> <laughs> very well done for that. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a question that I didn't tell you I was going to ask you, but, you know, three rules if you want to join Finn. Tell me what listening now. What are the three rules? Um, well, there's probably two, actually. Um, one is pay your membership. Um, and second is participate. Um, you know, we all it's really quite simple. It, the, the membership fee is really modest. Um, you know, for very large companies, it's £3,000 a year which for all the benefits that come out of it, that's a pretty modest fee. Um, and, and we do expect you to participate because we, we do not feel it's fair that, you know, you can get access to all this information if you don't put anything into it. So, so we do monitor that, um, you know, and people will get a nudge from the legal people because they know who it is if nobody submits any data in a quarter. Um, you know, and you're almost allowed one quarter's grace because we recognise, you know, that people get <laughs> to have challenges. But, but in the interest of fairness to all the other members, you know, we require you to participate. Um, and that really, it's, it's the two rules, Chris, to be honest. Yeah, OK, even even better. Thanks for that. Janice, it's your turn to go come under the spotlight. And, uh, you know, there were, there were the questions that you thought you were going to be asked, and now there's the question that I am going to ask you, OK? It's <laughs> slightly different. Because I want to ask you about the quality of data as well. I'll go back. I'm an analytical chemist. Every piece of data we generate, we check and we double check and we triple check and there has to be you know, quality assured. How, how can you say you do the same thing with all of the disparate sorts of data that you collect, particularly data from, I would say, the, the grey literature from, from social media? It's, it's reliability, accuracy. Convince me that, that you've, you've got systems in place that you, you can cut out the, the, the background noise. Great question, and good that it's not the ones that I uh, I have noted down. Eh? It's it's better. <laughs> <laughs> this keeps me in interest. So uh, I will start with the data that we are getting from official sources, eh? from authorities, from organizations that uh, we know that a very good job is is done in terms of data. And then we'll go to the most challenging part of. Uh, any data source out there, uh, social media, media sites, and so on. So for the first, for the uh, control data sources, for the ones that are official, uh, official uh, what we are doing is that uh, we cross-check the data also, uh, comparing the data with the historical data that we get from the, from the same organization. Uh, so we can see if uh, the same format or the same quality of data or if there are any uh, uh, extreme values that will indicate that something is not right, either this is in terms of units or this is in terms of the terminology that is used. So this is, uh, th these are the processes that we have uh, that run continuously and every time that we are getting data from a specific data source, even if this is a high quality data source, uh, marked as a high quality data source in our uh, systems, we will still compare uh, the data with the historical data that we have and uh, with the standards that we have internally uh, in the uh, aggregation system. So this is, this is the one part. The second part is that we rely very much of the, on the metadata. There's no good data without metadata. So when we have metadata, uh, we can be sure that the specific column in the specific spreadsheet is referring to the analytical result. And in this analytical result, the specific unit is used. If we don't have enough data, enough information, enough meta information, metadata for the specific data set, we will not use the specific data set or we will try to contact the organization and ask for clarifications for the specific uh, data set. So this is the part of the high, uh, of, the, of the accurate data source, so the more uh, controlled data sources. 
if we go and just to add on that, that we always have human experts that are supervising the results of the algorithms of the text processing and all the of the enrichment and analysis of all the textual and numerical data so this is always in place and we have a confirmation by domain experts when we are moving to the sources to like social media on media sites uh, then the criteria that we have to uh, publish something and use something in the uh, prediction models uh, are more strict. So in this case, we have, of course, we have the food safety experts and the data experts that are uh, supervising and that are confirming the quality of the information. Uh, and this is done uh, for a large, this is, uh, this is supported by the algorithms that we are using. So it's not that uh, we are uh, checking one by one on all the fields, but uh, we, we can do that also uh, uh, on a more mass uh, logic, on a more massive logic, uh, using specific dashboards that we have uh, to approve uh, the data that we are collecting. Uh, in some cases, we will also apply uh, algorithms for fake new, news identification if there is uh, uh, something that uh, is very new in terms of data source. And we are also cross-checking if the same information is uh, announced by different uh, sites, by different professional sites that are of high, that have high credibility in the food safety sector. So we will not publish something that is for the first time announced somewhere without uh, checking the quality of the information and cross-checking this information also with uh, other data sources. So, so these are the different layers that we are using to make sure that uh, we will deliver accurate information and that uh, we will use the accurate and clean data in order to apply the prediction models uh, that we have. Janice, many thanks, and I hope I didn't shock you too much with that question. You covered it extremely well. Sarah, on to you. You're probably wondering what I'm going to ask you now. <laughs> and it, it is really about the ability to share data across food supply chains. But this is where I, I get a little bit nasty and said is, you know what, I, I actually don't believe in food supply chains. I don't think they exist. Because every time I look at a supply chain, I just look at how complex they are. I call them networks, supply chain networks. And my goodness, a company like yours, you must have, what, 50,000 different SKUs? And that, that's a lot of networks. So how, how does your company think about sharing information across those different supply chains or as I prefer, supply networks? With great difficulty. I, mean, I could just answer and stop there. Yeah, um, not far off in terms of the SKUs. We, we ship containers of grapes around the globe, for example. I mean, it's just massive and the complexity is, it, it, it is a network. Uh, we use your diagram quite frequently, actually, to show how complex it is. Um, and, and the concerns, I, I guess, um, you know, what are the concerns given the complexity of the supply chain? It, well, the validity of the data for sure. You know, how trustworthy is the data? But as an industry, um, when we're thinking about what we can share, who we can share it with, you know, there's this whole sort of antitrust piece that come in, comes into it, which I think uh, Peter was mentioning much earlier, thinking about who owns that data and uh, how, how can we share it in a way that doesn't compromise sort of antitrust uh, laws, which you know is being uh, the biggest uh, market for us is the US. You know, very stringent uh, controls there. So that that's a big concern too. And when, when we're thinking about sharing data, um, and we've talked a lot about food fraud data, and I touched on the leafy greens piece. And even then, you know, as retailers coming together, we have to be really careful we don't share anything related to who our network is. It's and still in infancy, I think, as I listen to Finn around, how do we share more test data than we have in the past? Um, 
But I was also thinking as we're talking about, we've just been at the GFSI conference and I think about the difficulties that we've got in blowing. You know, when we see something um, that we think that, that that company probably shouldn't really be certified. How do I share that if I've got a non-disclosure agreement? I mean, as, as basic as that, when you think about how, how could we leverage what we see in a better way to really help, again, the consumer, going back to the consumer and, um, and preventative action, how can, how can you put all of that information together, which isn't necessarily test data, it's observational data and how valid is it? I mean, it's fraught with challenges within that complex network of a supply chain. But, but actually, if we could find a way to do that, we could probably prevent quite a few issues when you look at the root cause of recalls and you look at, well, that company was certified, you know, what, what was the root cause of that? Could that have been prevented? Did anyone know about that? Could we have shared it? But how can you do that? I mean, that that's the hurdle we have to overcome. But I mean, the question on here is a main concern and about stakeholders in the food supply chain. Then you get to the regulatory piece um, we have had discussions with FDA. How can we work more collaboratively? How can we share? Industry at large concern, I guess, is what the ramifications are if we find something or if, if an industry finds yeah. something and then is duty bound to share that. Do they, do they end up in a recall situation which they would have just dealt with somehow? Or um, I think sorts of concerns buzzing around still that we haven't yet really got to the bottom of a great opportunity to do so and um but i do think it's a stakeholder discussion I, I love the fact that that that's where it started in the uk and ireland and you've gotten to a point point where you're really comfortable with that and i think there are there are learnings we can probably leverage in in many other examples of data sharing more broadly for the common good because as we get more and more data we have to figure out how do we how do we do something with the data that actually matters and can actually help prevent uh, foodborne illness and safer, safer food at the end of the day? That, that's terrific. Many thanks. So the last round two questions for Peter, and I think Peter's probably been sitting there going, what's he going to ask me? And Peter, what I'm going to first of all say is you gave me a master class a number of years ago in looking at the complexity of networks, and I will never forget it. You, you, you drew it on a, on, a, on a PowerPoint presentation. And then, you know, the question really to you is how you as a regulator start to think about how can I map these networks? How can I understand where bad practice, where malpractice is happening? Is it something that the authorities should do or again, is this really about partnerships? Because you know, a lot of food businesses are much, much better at mapping supply chains now. So what, what's your perspective on, on the complexity of supply chains and how you can get the right information, share the right information? Peter, we cannot hear you. Sorry, I'm on mute. I, um, I, I, I thought you'd fallen <laughs> off your chair, so it's okay. <laughs> no, um, no, I'm still with you because I absolutely agree with you. The, 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 the food chains are networks, and I describe them as a maze, and they, they really, they're, they're unbelievably complex and global in nature, and the amount of movement of food and sales and transactions and that. And as Sarah said, for us then, so validity of data, if how to apply. So if I'm traveling down the road at 110 kilometers per hour and I know the speed lim limit is 100, do I go home and ring up the police and say I'm non-compliant and maybe you should investigate me or penalize me? Why then do we expect if an industry finds, say, a listeria monocytogen is 110 kindly forming units in a ready-to-eat food before it's used by date, well before it's used by date, what prompts them to share that information? Why would someone pick up the phone? Is that in the interest of public health? I, I genuinely want in the common good to protect consumers. Is it that um, I want to be compliant with legislation? There is a requirement on me. Is it the fear of being caught? 
um, and if you're caught, it's more damage to your reputation, or do you hide it? And my fear in big databases is that as regulators, we want to and have to find the non-compliant results. And um, that's where we have to be. And if people decide that they, they're going to hide it or not reveal it or hide it in a data set, so it is there, but it's, it's, it's hard to find. So if you have an incomplete data set or if you have the integrity of the data is in question or there's hidden or incorrect data, then you're making decisions on the basis of wrong data completely. And that serves no one's purpose and certainly not the public. And we're really, our remit is here is to protect public health. Um, we've had two very big investigations. One very recently where we went into a very big company and the auditor for the third party certification was there the day before, literally the day before, and gave a fantastic report and a great rating. And we found the most dire fraudulent practices we've ever come across uh, in a food company in Ireland. And um, we thought, how does this tally? You know, so why would we want to feed data from third party certification or accreditation if that's the quality of what you're getting? Now, this is in terms of food fraud and how much one person can do in terms of food fraud in an audit um, is questionable, I have to say. So we have to be concerned about the validity of the data going in um, to, to make good decisions. I suppose there's a few other things like we've mentioned before, the, the confidentiality versus transparency versus accountability. Um, we're, we're, we're years behind as well in the food safety authorities. And we're not Googles or Amazons or Ebays. So in terms of artificial intelligence and machine learning and internet of things and analysis of big data, we're not there, we're in our infancy. So um, we've started small, we looked at TripAdvisor and we generated tools to look right across TripAdvisor reviews of restaurants. And we said, what would this show us? And it actually showed us some things that are very interesting. Because people who say, think they've suffered food poisoning in a restaurant or had bad service or bad food, they put it up on the internet now. So you can get some very interesting results by just going through uh, online what TripAdvisor reviews might say. And that might target where we might go or outbreaks that might have occurred that we didn't know about. So, um, so yeah, uh, there's, there's a whole lot of difficulties. They don't outweigh the benefits, but there is things like ownership of data and who at, at the end of the day has ownership of this data. Is it anonymized data and does that give us best use of data when it is anonymized? Is the legislation keeping up with the need to share? Because we are restricted in some ways by legislative requirements. Have we the resources to do this properly and in an effective manner? Um, capability to change management, it's a new environment. We need to manage change to, to move into this direction. I think if we can, it's going to show us a whole lot about food chains and complex food systems and complex mazes of food movements. Um, but it still depends. The whole thing is, can we depend on this? Is, it, is this database genuine? Is the information correct? Have, have, has people step, have people stepped outside? Because the people we chase in food fraud investigations, they're never going to share the data. They're never going to put up, I'm selling illicit alcohol that I made in a unit that nobody knows exists and I make it from industrial alcohol and I'm buying bottles from China and I have labels printed in Ukraine. And then um, you're never going to see that in a data set. So whereas it does have tremendous use for legitimate industry, it still doesn't get us by the illegitimate carry on, I suppose. Yeah, Peter, thank you. Um, and I think the last point you made is unbelievably salient because analyzing data around food safety is very, very different from analysing data around food fraud, and I, I've, I've learned that over many years. Now, what I'm going to do is, remember I told you there was only going to be two rounds? Well, I, I lied to you because there's round three is about to begin. And here's the rules of round three is, I'm going to ask you a question, and you have to answer me within one minute, okay? And then after that, I'm going to come to the audience question. So please, Type, type in any questions you have. And I'm going to start off with Helen. Helen, I know you like a challenge. <laughs> is Finn, you've got nearly 50 members. Not anymore. And 
is it is it an exclusive club for for the Brits and the Irish, or or is it is it open to the world? Tell us. Yeah, um, it is open. I think initially when we started, Finn, we we talked about protecting the UK and Ireland markets. And we were perhaps a bit parochial. But again, linking back to, you know, walk before you can run, um, we needed to establish the systems and the processes and rules um, to get the network up and running. But, but as we've grown and as our systems have got more sophisticated, we do recognise with global supply chains, it just makes sense to open it up. So the answer is, yes, it is open to non-UK members. Oh, thank you. Thanks, thanks very much for that. I think, uh, Sarah, you're, you're, you're next. Now, you've got all of the data that you collect. You've got all of the clever companies like AgriNo do all of the data analysis. What's the one thing, you know, you wake up in the morning, you'll have, you, you turn on your computer, your iPad or whatever it is, and, and you have a piece of information. What would the one piece or two pieces of information that you could get every morning that you can't currently get now, how would it make your job easier? How would it uh, <clears throat> protect your company and I always say, how will it protect your consumers? Those three things. So what's that big piece of data that you would like to, to have analyzed in front of you? That's more than a minute. <laughs> Any more than a minute. <laughs> that day. God, that's such a question. Um, um, it, it really is the emerging issue, I guess. It's like, look here today, you know, look here now, this is happening. It's the immediacy, the timeliness. I suppose sometimes I feel we don't know until some way down the road and, and we could have prevented selling things if we'd known sooner. So speed, speed and all and validity, I would say piece of data that comes to me fast and that's valid is something that and something that I can react to and do something about would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Janice, it, it, it's your turn. No. What I would like to ask you is, you know, your company is trying to produce a, I would call it a coalition of the good. Those people who are trying to, you know, really do the right thing, trying to prevent food safety issues, uh, uh, crises about about fraud. Now, what, what, how is it you're trying to achieve this? How, how are you trying to bring the coalition of the good together? This is a good one, huh? in one minute. And we need some months to deal with the issue that uh, Sarah <laughs> mentioned. So uh, the, the most important thing that uh, we are trying to achieve in order to help the food industry is to deliver all the interconnected data that uh, for the important parameters and factors that we need to take into consideration uh, that can help us to build the prediction models that will predict and will prevent food safety incidents in the supply chain. So this is what we are dreaming of. This is what we are working on. And uh, this is a challenge, a very important challenge that uh, keeps us awake every day. Uh, to connect all this data, all the available data that's out there. Thanks very much. Peter, the, the, final, the final one minute question goes to you. And uh, I guess it's around, this whole session is about public-private partnerships. It's about food businesses starting to trust regulators and, and, and regulators trusting more food businesses. What do you think the future is? You know, do you think that the direction of travel of what we've done in Finn is the right model to follow? Or do you think there, there are better ways that we should be thinking about building that relationship, which will protect businesses and protect people? Yeah, I can answer that in a minute, all right, because um, I do think Finn is absolutely the way to go. However, I'd like to wake up in the morning and see Finn saying, you know what, we don't need to anonymize this data anymore. We, we put out that data and we'll attribute to every company and um, we'll trust that the regulator will take a proper view of it in partnership with us because it, information lies with industry. It doesn't lie with the regulators. 
we as regulators don't wake up in the morning and have any information, um, but industry have all of that information, and particularly in food fraud, the information is with industry. You know much, much more than we do about what's going on out there. So um, I think eventually this will happen. I, think, I don't think it's today or tomorrow, but eventually I don't think we'll have to have anonymized um, data sets. We'll have people comfortable to share um, because we're all in this for the same reason. We're all chasing the bad guy. We're all protecting public health. We're all protecting people's interests. So um, as long as we have that common goal, um, I think that's the direction of flow, but uh, that might be a pipe dream, but um, that's, that's, I'd love to see it go in that direction. Okay. <clears throat> but, I, but I think it's a very, very important point you make, so thank you for that. So a couple of questions from the audience just to finish this, this extremely good session. And, you know, one of the questions with is there, there are the known knowns. So there's those things. I mean, Sarah, you talked about the massive issues about E. coli. You know, we, we know about massive adulteration that's going on and things like herbs and spices at the moment in different parts of the world. But it's dealing with the unknowns. It's these emerging hazards you know some of them might be the you know consequences of the COVID pandemic it could be consequences of climate change it could be other things and really in terms of data and data analytics how how are we going to start to manage those things which previously you know you put up your hands and go well there's no way we could ever have, have expected or anticipated that so, Janis, over to you first, the data analytics side. How do you deal with the unknowns? Yeah, so dealing with the things that have happened so far is uh, a, an easy uh, thing to do. It still has some challenges, and we, uh, as we mentioned, but uh, you can do it. But managing the unknown is uh, a more challenging thing, but still we can do things. I will mention two things. The one is uh, by knowing an increasing trend for uh, a hazard, like for instance, a biological hazard, and I will mention the case of ETO, where Salmonella was found to be increasing for a large period, uh, for two years or three years, uh, during the last two or three years in sesame seeds. So this increase very much the risk of using an unauthorized chemical uh, to in order to address this uh, biological hazard and this was exactly the case what happened and so when we see a trend an increasing trend in a hazard we can predict that this will be addressed with another hazard like uh, a chemical uh, the use of a chemical to fight the biological hazard. So this is the one case where we can identify an unknown. The other case is that uh, we can identify how a problem can be expanded also to other ingredients and commodities because they came, they come from the same regions where the same uh, uh, practices are used when uh, by the growers or by the producers. So, for instance, if you have an increased uh, uh, trend for a pesticide used uh, in Turkey or in another region or in Egypt, this, based on the knowledge that we have on where these pesticides are also used in other uh, ingredients, in other crops, we can predict that the same problem may be also found in other crops. So these are two ways of identifying the unknown. Uh, and you, we can we can discuss it for hours if we uh, also include other factors like the weather, the climate change, the environmental conditions. There are many such cases. I just selected two ones that are, uh, you know, easy to understand and uh, they, are, they are very uh, it's also very realistic to cope with them. Janice, many thanks for that. What I can say to the panel now is time to relax. I'm not going to ask you any more questions. I just think for the last couple of minutes of the session, just 
a little bit of, of wrapping up, just kind of a, a bit of thought collection. So what's really clear is there is a wealth of data, huge amounts of data out there. And thinking about how to collect the data together, how to analyze the data, turn it from data to intelligence. You know, there, there are more and more techniques based on AI, machine learning, and so forth. That's really clear. How to use the data in terms of preventing <clears throat> big food safety issues, fraud issues. I think we, we, we have explored some of the really difficult stuff about how you share the information between companies, between companies and regulators was discussed. And it's not straightforward. It, it, it's not easy at all. There, there, are, there are many, many uh, uh, difficulties around all of this. Oh, I'm, I'm a big advocate of, of Finn and what has Finn has done. <clears throat> and I tell you, I've looked across the world and I haven't seen anything else like it. Nothing <clears throat> where, where the, the amount of, of information that is shared that converts to intelligence and then you know, is actioned not only by food businesses, but the regulators it is something that I would, I would uh, really think you should look at in, in more detail. Oh, what we want to do is think about for, for, for the participants is this whole idea about building a community on public private data sharing. And there, there is on the slide, there, there's this uh, uh, website, <clears throat> the URL, openfoodintelligence.org. Really encourage you to <clears throat> log on to that. It's really asking a few questions. It's, it's offering for you to become a part of a community. There's, there's no charge associated with this. We're not asking you for information, but it's really about building this community around information sharing, intelligence sharing. So I, I would very much encourage you to, to join. Now, what I'm gonna finish off with is just a big round of thanks. I think we've had you know, one and a half hours of pretty intensive discussions. Um, I have grilled the, 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 the panel to, uh, to a degree that they probably weren't expecting. But I think the quality of the information that was provided, I, I just think it was very open, very honest, you know, uh, no, no uh, stones were left unturned about some of the, the issues. So I'd very much like to thank the panel, I'd like to thank Sarah from Walmart in terms of, of, of the view of, you know, the, the world's largest retailer. I want to thank Peter because Peter, I, I know very well, you know, undertakes really complex investigations and, and uh, information is, is king. Helen, not only for the work in terms of Finn, but also, you know, as one of the leading technical directors in the UK and showing that degree of leadership and talking through some of the big practical difficulties and, 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 and you know, technical issues that, that, that got in the way of Finn and how they were overcome. I'd also would like to thank Janice because, you know, I, I probably put you under, under the spotlight maybe more than anything else, just in terms of how you collect the data, how you analyze the data, how you quality assure that. So I want to thank all of you for, for, for the, the dialogue, for the conversation. I hope the, the audience of, of this session found it, found it useful. I, I certainly did. There's, there's lots of things that I will go away and think about. So wherever you are in the world, I hope you have <clears throat> continue to have a nice day, be it morning, afternoon, or evening. Uh, don't be too worried about what the next big food safety risk is because data analytics is going to tell you what it is and hopefully before it actually happens. So with that, I will thank you all very much. Last person to thank is Francesca, who has been operating all of the slides for me. She actually didn't trust me to move the slides forward and back. And I think that was a pretty wise call. Francesca, thank you. Thank you all very much. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Francesca. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.